please welcome to the stage Brian Fallon, co-founder and executive director of Demand Justice. Hello, thank you. Welcome to the 2022 Demand Justice Ideas Conference, A Path Ahead for Court Reform. This is the first one of these we've ever done. Extremely grateful for everybody that's here. Um, if you look around, you'll see a lot of folks in green shirts. If you see them, if you're seated at a table next to them or you're in line next to them at lunch today, please say thank you. These are our volunteers that are out in states <laughs> taking action, pressing their members of Congress to support court reform, and so there are folks, there are eyes and ears on the ground, so we wanted them to be here today as we talk about the strategy going forward on court reform. Um, and then we also have a lot of colleagues here from the nonprofit space here in DC, for whom this might be two days or two hours at least away from Zoom meetings and a free lunch, and we welcome you too. Uh, so whatever brought you here, we're grateful to have you, um, and this is an important topic. I don't have to tell anybody in this room uh, that democracy is in peril right now, and a big part of that is the Supreme Court. And we, as we stand here today, uh, we're about five days away from the uh, new term kicking off at the Supreme Court, and it promises to bring another set of awful rulings on top of all the bad rulings that we just saw last summer. Um, everything from affirmative action to this crackpot theory on the independent state legislature theory, which would basically deprive uh, citizens of the ability to elect their own leaders, um, all of that is coming down the pike, and so there couldn't be a more apt time to talk about the Supreme Court and the threat that it poses and what we can do about it. Um, as bad as things are with the Supreme Court right now, uh, there is some reason for optimism. There's at least three trend lines that we've been watching since June that give us hope and we think make for ingredients to build a movement for reform. First of all, you've seen in poll after poll, Pew, Gallup, multiple public polls since June have shown Disapproval of the court is at its highest level ever. That's true among Democrats, it's true among independents. And of course, the court does not have an army. It does not have the power of the purse. The court's power comes from its legitimacy, from the people having confidence in the court and its rulings. And so when we see confidence at a low ebb in the Supreme Court, that means that the court's in a crisis of legitimacy, and that's the moment that we're in right now. Um, so now we have to talk about how we, how we harvest that disapproval. How do, we make, how do we leverage that into a movement for reform? The second thing that we're seeing that is quite promising is the, it, the salience or the intensity of the issue of the Supreme Court has never been higher. Uh, when we started, when Chris Kang and I started Demand Justice in 2018, part of the problem that we were trying to solve was indifference, to be honest, among Democratic voters towards the issue of the court. We were coming off a 2016 cycle where people like Karen and I saw that the issue of Merrick Garland's hang nomination hanging in the balance was just not a motivator for voters in 2016. And the polls confirmed that Republican voters for Donald Trump were much more motivated by the court than were Democratic voters. Well, the opposite was true in 2020. Joe Biden won Supreme Court voters for the first cycle in many election cycles. And this year's 2022 midterms are shaping up to be the second national election cycle in a row where Democratic voters are telling pollsters that they care more about the Supreme Court as a motivating issue than Republicans. So that's a second good trend line that we're seeing. And the third and last one is one that brings us here today. Support for reform, in particular expansion, is rising. Just last week, Mar Marquette University, which is considered by many to be the gold standard for polling on public sentiment about the Supreme Court, came out with a new poll showing for the first time in the history of that poll, 51% of all voters support adding four seats to the Supreme Court of the United States of America. That's a big deal. If you break it down, the numbers are even better. 70 plus percent of Democratic voters support it. 51% of independent voters. 60% of women voters support expansion. 63% of black voters support expansion. So we know that our party leadership is not there yet. Obviously, President Biden is not there yet. Speaker Pelosi is not there yet. Leader Schumer is not there yet. We're confident they'll get there, but they're not there yet. Uh, but what gives us hope is the fact that we feel that there is something bubbling up at a grassroots level. Uh, it is remarkable to see 70% of Democrats, for instance, already supporting this proposal when the elected leadership of the party that goes on MSNBC all day is not yet talking about this. So just think of the consensus that we'll be able to forge once we get more of our elected leaders in Congress talking about this. And that's what all the green-shirted donning individuals today are helping us do. And so that's why we're so grateful to them. Um, we have a great panel, a great series of panels today. 
a great lineup. We're going to talk about how we build on this momentum. How do we translate all that frustration and disapproval in the Supreme Court into action? How do we get more of our elected leaders on record in support of the Judiciary Act? Um, so really pleased with the lineup that we have, Some folks seated in here front that I'm so excited to hear from. Um, Martin Luther King III is going to be here in about an hour to um, indicate that he and the organization that he leads, the Drum Major Institute, are going to be getting involved in this fight, and that's a big deal. Um, we're going to be hearing from some repro advocates and leaders and strategists um, in just a moment about post-Dobbs, how the opinion is shifting in that movement. Um, but to kick things off, I wanted to introduce a quick little video segment. Um, uh, former boss of mine at the Justice Department and proponent of court expansion, um, wanted to be here but couldn't, so asked if he could send a video, and we said, absolutely, we'll take you in any form we can get you. So please direct your attention to the monitors for a brief hello from uh, the 82nd Attorney General of the United States, Eric Holder. And thank you again for being here. I'm sorry that I can't be with you today, but I want to thank each of you for for taking the time to be part of the discussion today, and more significantly, for being part of this critical fight. I also wanna thank Brian Fallon and his team for bringing all of us together. You know, I worked with Brian at the Department of Justice. He's a great colleague, a man devoted to his country, and he's damn smart too. We are at a moment of reckoning in America. Key institutions, the literal pillars of our democracy, are threatened by elements of a Republican party that is comfortable bending and even breaking norms, rules, and traditions in order to acquire and to maintain political power. One of those threatened pillars is unfortunately our judicial branch, and more specifically, our Supreme Court is at risk. Throughout most of American history, the vast majority of justices served until death. But since 1950, four out of five justices have chosen to retire and in general, have timed their retirement to take place while a president whose ideology they supported was in office. And as a result, every recent nomination has become a war with the future of our country perceived to be at stake. In recent years, the confirmation process has been used to deny a president and the American people the opportunity to place new justices on the court by not following regular order. The legitimacy of the Supreme Court has as a result been questioned. It has become an untenable state. Well, thankfully, it's in our power to change it. First, we need term limits. Public polls show that more than three in four Americans oppose life tenure. It's also been embraced by none other than Chief Justice John Roberts. Earlier in his career, he noted that terms of around 15 years, and I quote, would ensure that federal judges would not lose all touch with reality through decades of ivory tower existence, unquote. Now, I propose a term limit of 18 years and put in place a law that would enable each president to name a new justice in the first and third year of each of his or her terms. This would decrease the pressure that now surrounds each new appointment and ensure that the court is refreshed on a fairly consistent basis. There must be a requirement that the Senate vote within 90 days from the president's nominees so that there would be no repeat of the Mitch McConnell skullduggery surrounding the Merrick Garland nomination. Finally, the court must be expanded. At a minimum, the two seats filled in an inappropriate way by McConnell, one where there was ample time to confirm a new justice and one where a nominee was rushed through while the American people were voting in a presidential election, the court must be expanded to address the inappropriate but successful rigging of the court. At the maximum, the court should be expanded so that there is at least one justice per circuit, as was done the last time the court was expanded. That would entail expanding the court by four. Significantly, the most recent polling shows that the majority of the American people support court expansion. Taken together, the result of these reforms would be a court reflecting the best of our systems, rather than a body being constructed by acts of God, death, strategically timed retirements, and political malfeasance. That would answer questions about the legitimacy of the court and put back in place an institution governed by principle, precedent, and not driven by nature of personnel. You know, for all of us who care about protecting our democracy, how to strengthen key democratic institutions like the Supreme Court is an important question. Fortunately, you're gonna be hearing from some really brilliant thinkers and activists today including a renowned activist in the fight for democracy, my friend, Martin Luther King III. 
Now, I hope that you will continue the struggle for a fair and impartial judiciary going forward. Thank you for your time, the work that you will do today, and your commitment to never stop fighting for a stronger, more fair, and more just America.